Hi, I'm so glad you're listening to this episode. We'll meet our guests soon, but first I'm going to share my latest inspirational listen. It's a podcast called More Than Work that helps us see ourselves as more than the job we do. Ravi Akun, who's a marketing manager, stand-up comic, writer, and nonprofit volunteer, hosts More Than Work. She gets that we're not just defined by the jobs we're doing. All of her guests share how they've pursued new passions and hobbies and work that reflect their values. If you listen, you'll find out what that has meant in their lives and how pursuing that passion also helps others around them. I'll put the trailer to this show at the end of this episode. And you can find More Than Work anywhere you listen to podcasts and at the website raviasaid.com. Do you want to change the world? So do I. On this show, we meet artists whose work is doing just that. Welcome to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Anybody else have to read A Tale of Two Cities in seventh grade? Depending on your perspective, I wonder if that's a phrase that can be said in any era. For example, works by Black authors, other writers of color, and LGBTQ authors and artists are being banned from school libraries. Every time I hear of the latest book under fire, I think, wait a minute, I read that book. I loved that book. And I imagine how reading many of these banned books in middle school or high school could literally save a kid's life. And I think these are definitely the worst of times. But then something amazing happens. That's what I want to talk about on this episode. A funny, heartwarming, poignant, and inspiring film was just shown on PBS about artists who have historically been marginalized and who, in spite of this, maybe because of this, created work that sustained generations of people. I'm talking about Vivian Kleiman's fantastic documentary film, No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics. Being able to watch this film on PBS is definitely the best of times. Whether you're a longtime fan of comics or whether you've never given them a second thought, this film opens the door to the world of comics created by queer artists. What does it mean to create art that represents your life experience and that of your community? And how does this work validate everyone who's longed to see themselves represented? And what about people outside of the queer community who see the work and say, hey, I felt that exact same way. No Straight Lines is the story of marginalized comic artists who put themselves on the map. It feels amazing to celebrate them having this moment in the spotlight, and I'm thrilled that Vivian is on the show to talk about making this film. We're about to meet today's guest. Before we do, just a quick reminder to follow Art Heals All Wounds on your favorite listening app. Five-star ratings are also always appreciated because they help us grow our audience. Let's meet documentary filmmaker Vivian Kleiman. Vivian is a Peabody award-winning filmmaker. Her work covers a wide range of subject matter, all earmarked by Vivian's innovative visual approach, her clarity on the content, and often just the right amount of humor. She's also a writer and consultant, has taught at Stanford University and at California State University Hayward. 
Her latest film, No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics, covers five pioneers of queer comic artists. We get an intimate look at the work of Alison Bechtel, Rupert Kennard, Howard Cruz, Jennifer Camper, and Mary Wings. But we also meet a whole new generation of LGBTQ artists creating comics. I'm so glad Vivian is on the show today to tell us about the making of this film. Hi, Vivian. Thank you so much for being on Art Heals All Wounds. Can you start by introducing yourself, telling us who you are and what you do? Hi, thank you so much for having me, Pam. It's really a delight to have a chance to um, talk with you. I am an independent documentary filmmaker, which I like to say is a uh, misnomer because I'm extremely dependent. (laughs) (laughs) Since I sadly lack a trust fund, I'm very much dependent on foundations, philanthropists, and individuals to support my work. Well, your latest film is called No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics, and I just saw it, and it is so good. And I'm really excited to talk to you about it. I have a lot of questions I want to ask, but just to start things off, how did it come about that you made this film? Yeah, in this particular case, it's actually an important question because I am not a comics geek. (laughs) So it's actually a film by a semi-outsider, an Mm. insider-outsider. Of course, like most American kids, I grew up addicted to comics and, you know, Batman and Superman and the fuzzy animal kind of stuff, Uh, graduating to Mad Magazine. (laughs) And then not so much, no connection to comics until the 80s. I was privileged to have access to Alison Bechtel's Dykes to Watch Out For, which was a, it was a lifeline for uh, lesbians at that time. It came out in the local feminist newspaper here in Oakland, or Bay Area, it was called Plexus. And I'll never forget, we would all wait with bated breath for the next installment to find out what happened to the characters. And it was finally seeing ourselves represented in the media, and especially Mm. to have our stories represented in comics that were at once humorous, but also poignant. And it was that intersection of both. It was resonating on so many different levels at the same time that really uh, captured my heart. That's a long-winded way of saying it was Alison Bechtel that was my lifeline as a young lesbian. The project actually got started by Justin Hall, who's the expert in the history of queer comic books and who edited the first anthology of queer comics by the same name, No Straight Lines, for decades of queer comics. And someone planted the bee in the bonnet that he should translate that compendium to a documentary film. So Mm -hmm. he met up with a person named Greg Sirota, a filmmaker who used to live in the Bay Area, And the the two of them started to try to make the film and just never got any traction. And finally, Greg approached me and asked if I wanted to take over the project. I didn't run (laughs) to say yes, because I, as I said, I'm not a comics geek and it wasn't uh, something that was part of my daily life. But Justin in particular encouraged me to attend the world's first in-gathering of queer comic book makers And that was held in New York at Hunter College. And I walked into, you know, the conference space and I was overwhelmed by the joy and the life affirming energy that was there that ran, that was so counter to my understanding of comics, comic book artists, which was really delineated by the likes of Robert Crumb and, you know, would have been more curmudgeonly and snarky and sarcastic and the antithesis of what I was seeing in that room. And over the next few days, I got to hear all these stories as people were presenting their work on different panels, panels meaning workshops. Mm -hmm. And I saw the work, I heard the stories, I met people, and I went, oh my God, is this ever a film that's going, it's like, telling queer history through the vernacular of young people, which is Mm. comics. Mm. And it was so intersectional. There was such a panoply of all of us, from the GQ gentleman to the young person with chartreuse dyed hair and the visible body parts 
completely covered with tats. <laughs> right. And um, I came home from that weekend knowing that there was a very strong film there. Well, that's fascinating to learn that because I also don't have much of a connection to comics and your film, it's not just accessible. That's not a strong enough word. It really just draws you into that world until by the end, it's like, I'm going to check out. <laughs> now I want to be in the world of comics. And also what you said about the thing about your film is that it's interesting. There's lots of lightheartedness, but there are moments of real poignancy, you know, because you were telling a history that was represented in comics and that was shared between this community of artists. So the film is just incredible in that it hits a lot of highs in terms of emotions and then some painful lows in there as well. I would definitely say painful. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about the scene of Jennifer Camper when you're asking her about the height of the AIDS epidemic. That was very, very hard, you know, and it's, I'm glad you put that in there. I didn't expect it, but, you know, those of us of a certain age, I think you move forward and medications have improved and you kind of forget what it was like. And that was really a good reminder of, oh, yeah, I remember that. Right. and but, but let me just say that for me, what was really curious and new was, yes, I had, like you, I had lived through the AIDS epidemic and the trauma and the horror of loss and the punctuation of our social life being going to funerals and memorials. But the what was new for me and what we included in the film is the artist's representation of right. that experience, which is so uplifting. Even the artwork in response to the AIDS epidemic ranges from anger and rage and grief to the humorous. And that part, the, it was the range of artwork right. that really caught me by surprise and went, oh yeah, <laughs> this is what artists do. <laughs> and they have emotions and lots of reactions. And of course, that's going to be reflected in queer comics as well. Right, right. I had no idea about any of this work being done at that time. But one thing I do want to talk about in terms of the film's visuals, they are amazing. And you have some that are just the artwork. You have lots of the B-roll of the artist actually showing us how they draw something and shade it in or color it in, which I also really love. But then you give it some very dynamic cinematic touches, like a few places you animated some of the work, or you put in a sound design, or you put it within a different type of frame to contextualize it. So I really would love to hear the story of working with something like comics, which are fabulous if you're into them, but it could have been just a very dry, like, oh, here's this image of a comic. What was the creative process like as you were coming up with how to treat these comics and this art? I love that you're opening up the door for me to have discussion about the process of creating the documentary. When I looked at the first assembly of the film, I knew that there was going to be a lot of pain in terms of leaving out, omitting a lot of stuff, because <laughs> there was a plethora of images to choose from. I also knew that there was a lot of people that were going to not be included because you can, I wanted it to be more intimate and I wanted the viewer to have time both with a few individual artists to get to actually like be inside their heads and more, more importantly, their hearts for a few minutes, but also with the artwork. Mm -hmm. So if you add all that up, four decades, actually five in the end, and 80 minutes it is of film, it's not a whole lot of uh, real estate for the viewer to get to know any one artist. Once I had a rough cut assembled, and I had gone through that process of narrowing down uh, images and people, it kind of felt a little flat. It kind of felt like you were saying, oh, this is interesting. It covers all the points. But it didn't feel like it had the complexity and the emotional tenor that I wanted to achieve. 
uh, I knew I wanted to do something that was going to have a longer shelf life. And I knew that in order to accomplish that, it had to have more than one layer. It had to have more than one note. And I knew that just showing, I observed that when I looked at the full image of the comics, when I was talking about, let's say, Howard Cruz, the godfather of queer comics, we're looking at some of his work, I realized, oh, it's too much for a viewer to take in. There's too much, there's text, there's images, there's more than one panel, there's all this stuff. So I knew I had to um, narrow the focus literally in terms of the camera. I knew that I had to zoom in mm. tighter and I knew that I couldn't have much text on screen because a viewer can't both listen to somebody talking. You can't hear, you can't hear Howard talk about his process of art making or his story of coming out, going from Madison Avenue design, a graphic designer to an independent queer uh, cartoonist. So that began a process of one, deciding that it was okay to just zoom in on an artist's work, which is basically editing. Mm -hmm. I am taking their work and I am like distorting it to serve my purpose. <laughs> I checked in with a few artists to make sure it was okay. And everybody, you know, said, oh yeah, we expect you to do that. Right. Zoom in, zoom out, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, that's fine. And then I also asked my editing team to select images that had less text and that were more image based so that we could deal with that conflict of trying to read while trying to look at the work while trying to right. listen to the narrative, if there was one, and there usually was. So then we had images that were tighter to look at, had less text, but it still felt like it was missing something. And then one day I thought, oh, well, the comics have these outlines. And I was looking at, at Alison Bechtel, who's one of the five pioneer artists featured in the film. Mm -hmm. And I reached over my shelf one day at lunch and I grabbed one of these little books that she, she would do these, she would publish these compilations of some of her work in these little books. And I saw on the cover that she had drawn the black rectangle around uh, the image of the, the book cover itself as a way to signify that this is a book about comics. Right. And I went, oh, well, if Allison can do it on the cover of a book, I can do it <laughs> in, in the film. Right. And so we started having a black square around some of the people in the film. And then I saw, well, wait a second. Allison's doing this black rectangle. It's part of the, you know, shorthand for comics in general. Everybody knows that symbol. But this is film. Film is about motion. Film is a time-based medium. And... I am taking the viewer on a certain voyage, as it were. And so then I reached out to my pal, Suzanne Slatcher, who's a, an animator, from hails from Pixar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess she has the credentials to, do, <laughs> to animate a black line. <laughs> in any event, uh, thus began a relationship, uh, a professional relationship with Suzanne, whereby we started playing with, well, if we're animating this little black line going around, we can also think about other kinds of animation and mm -hmm. thus began using animation in a very gentle way, not as like a separate chapter of its own, which has become a convention in documentary filmmaking, but more as in relationship to the images and the storytelling as they unfold in the film. It was such a great idea. It really brought some of those sections to life. And I also did, I'm going to make a confession, I watched it when it was broadcast, but then I streamed it and I stopped on some of the artwork to like just, I just want to get all the detail. So that was really fun. It's fun that it's in there. I'm glad you did that. I was going to say too, with the idea of the black line, you have sort of as a structure in your film, the sort of dialogue between the pioneers of queer comics and the current generation of queer comics. And I love that you created this dialogue between the two. And I'm wondering, when did you have that idea? Did you always know that was going to be the structure? Or when did you decide that that would be a great thing to way to structure it? Oh, Pam, you warm my heart with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a process editing geek. So that's why I want to know. 
I, and you are really, really excellent at it, at framing those questions. It is so funny because now I have to confess. <laughs> All along, I absolutely insisted the film was not going to mention any comic past the year 2006. And as you just noted, in fact, by the end of the project, we are including uh, work that was contemporary up to the moment when we finished the film in 2021. Here's the deal. We were already covering, as I said, all these decades of film. Everybody said, well, you have to like bring it up to date. And I'm saying, well, the film's going to be watched 10 years from now. So what does up to date mean mm -hmm. <laughs> 10 years in the future? We don't know what it's going to be like. The only thing we know is that it's going to be very different. Then one day I sat and watched again. I watched the, another rough cut and I went, hmm, well, the animated rectangle is working nicely. The other little features are working nicely, but the film is lacking a certain um, life, a certain vitality, and it felt like I went like you just said you you would watch it. A, you did watch it a second time in a row. Yeah. When I watched that rough cut, I thought I would not watch this film a second time. Hmm. What do I need to do? to correct that, because I did want it to be a piece that somebody might be inclined to watch a second time. And I don't know where the idea came from, but I mentioned that I was encouraged to go to the first in-gathering of Queers and Comics, first conference that was held in New York. Two years later, there was a second conference um, mm -hmm. held in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I woke up, maybe it was two weeks before the conference, and I thought, hmm, why don't I just go there invest in a day of shooting and film some of the young people who are there and see what kind of comments I get. Right. And maybe that will lead to some ideas. It was all done in the realm of experimentation. I had no idea how I was going to use the stuff. It's the kind of experiment that you can only do as an independent filmmaker when you're not beholden to like a station or the investor. <laughs> now there's investors in documentaries. Right. I would have to show a treatment and show how, a script and show how I would use the stuff and defend spending the money. So we set up camp in one of the rooms. It was held at the California College for the Arts in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. They generously let us uh, have access to one of the rooms where I can't say it was quiet, but at least it wasn't <laughs> so distracted. My assistant, Justin, knew a bunch of, obviously he was one of the coordinators of the conference and teaching at CCA himself. So he gave us a list of some suggested students and former students to talk to. And then my assistant went into the hallway and just grabbed some interesting looking people. <laughs> Remember the chartreuse colored hair and yes. tats? The generation that's coming up and uh, in, in comics. I had literally 10 minutes on the clock with each person, about a dozen people. I didn't know their work. I was introduced to them by the assistant, so I heard their name, but had no meaning. And I threw them in front of a white screen to offset them from the way I filmed everybody else. At the end of the day of shooting, Andy Black, the cinematographer, who'd been on all the shoots, Portland, Oregon, Vermont, uh, Massachusetts, Brooklyn, Andy looked at me and goes, Viv? That was one of the most amazing days of filming I've ever done. The stories are absolutely riveting and incredible. And I don't have any idea how the hell you're going to use this stuff. And when we came to the editing room, I thought of them as a Greek chorus. Mm. I thought of something very simple. They could introduce a chapter. They could end a chapter. And that's kind of very, you know, linear. It's a linear way of thinking about using a whole different element in the film. When I showed the next rough cut with that kind of structure in place, I showed it to people who were over the age of 50, and they said, Climate, you can't just plunk these people in the middle of your film. If you're going to have these people, you're going to have to tell me who they are and what kind of work they do and where they come from and where they're going and what their aspirations are and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I went, okay, it's not working for them. I showed it to younger people under the age of 30. And they looked at me and they go, Climate, what's the matter with you? <laughs> what's your question? <laughs> of course they work. Why, why, what are you questioning? Like, what's going, like, what, what, did you come from Mars or something? <laughs> like, so I knew that I was reaching my audience. My mm -hmm. audience was younger people, not older people. 
And uh, then it was a matter of try to make it work for both generations. And that was a matter, as you know, in filmmaking and everything, I mean, lots of the creative activities, be it, you know, writing a novel or an, an essay, you just kind of move ideas and blocks of text or images around. So finally, when you're lucky, they find a landing place. And that's the story of those images. Well, the compromise you came up with, if that's what it was, is so great because you're working with artists who have a body of work. So it works really well. I think you're right. I think it is, it makes it very dynamic in terms of reaching people who are younger. And just a sense of this is not some kind of contained history that ended in the year 2000. This is ongoing. There's a legacy to this. And so it does make it really exciting to feel like that's what you're seeing instead of just a history. Well, I love that interpretation of it. I just want to say that I didn't feel like it was a compromise to try to, you know, find a way that would complement both the younger and the older viewer. I felt like it's kind of just like when you're constructing a film, and you have a lot of disparate stories and tangents that you want to go on. And it's a matter of knowing the right pacing as when you can take the viewer on a, a side excursion and just mm -hmm. how far you can go before you have to bring them back. And if it's a matter of just, for me, some people are geniuses and get it right away. <laughs> I'm not. But it, it took just trial and error to find um, just how to insert those voices and find the right balance. I think it was really about the right balance rather than compromise, I guess. Mm, but nice. I really love the way you described how including their voices creates more of a continuum rather than just something uh, from the past. And really, at the heart, my goal was to put out a welcome mat to a younger viewer and also put out a welcome mat to people who couldn't care less about comics. Mm -hmm. Because that's that. although that's the subject matter, the issues that are raised are much bigger um, and broader and touch so many people. For example, one of the comics actually by Howard Cruz, and it's one that grabbed my heart that weekend um, in that first international in-gathering of queer comic book artists. He has a comic strip where this young person writes their coming out letter to their family, goes outside one wintry night in New York, snowy, uh, blizzardy and goes to the corner mailbox, puts the letter in the mailbox and immediately feels regret and remorse for having done it. Oh my God, what have I done? You know, and would do anything to retrieve that letter from the mailbox and not have it go to his family. And I thought, my God, that sense of regret of having written something or re remorse at having misspoken or said something perhaps mean or inappropriate or having, you know, we've all had that moment in our lives, you know, pretty much all of us, I think. Yes. I have in spades. Yes, me too. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, you know, that's what it's all about. It's like letting outsiders see, you know, that, oh, we have these shared human experiences. And yes, for queer people, it resonates on a very specific note but it also extends beyond that. Well, that's interesting because one of the things I was going to say about this film and the story that you tell is the way that you are showing these artists as their whole selves, not sort of pigeonholed into we are only going to talk about the aspect of your life that has to do with your gender, your sexual orientation. You are showing people who are writing comics and doing work about the whole human experience that we all are participating in. And one of the things that really got to me was the story of Rupert Kennard and his accident. And he discovered the whole area, the, the comic who was doing comics about being a paraplegic and that they kind of bonded over this shared way of expressing yourself through a particular medium. I love when Rupert went down that path, and I wasn't, when he was telling that story of connecting with this disabled comics artist in, in Portland, 
you know, I just thought, okay, this is something that's going to, as they say, hit the cutting room floor really fast. But then when I actually saw the work by that person, John Carlson, I think his name is, it was so hilarious. It is so and it was <laughs> It was so candid. It was so like inside the family candid without any shame or fear or, you know, self-consciousness. It was just absolutely candid. Um, and I went, oh my God, we have to put this in the film. And I don't care if people criticize me for going too far. Remember I was talking about, you know, going on these side excursions. I said, this is one side excursion. I'm going down and I don't care if I get criticized for it because it's just too precious. I have a couple of questions that I want to ask that are off the topic of the film itself. And if you don't want to answer this question, you don't have to. But <laughs> sure. what does it mean for you that this film was picked up by Independent Lens and shown on PBS? Au contraire, I, I am so thrilled for the opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to laugh with you, the fact that this film got picked up by national public television. Now, these are, the whole notion of queer comics is about artists who were marginalized even in the underground comic scene, mm -hmm. because the underground comics scene with people like Robert Crumb you know, and those folks were very misogynist very homophobic and many of them uh, racist, that there wasn't a place of acceptance for uh, queer artists to draw. So the notion of them, uh, people like Howard Cruz, Jen Camper, Mary Wings, just going out and doing their own thing and finding self-publishing on offset, you know, Mary Wings, you know, use the offset printing press and the basement of a women's karate, you know, right. studio in 1973. By the way, this is the 50th anniversary of the release of the of the publication of the first comic book by an out queer artist that is known. I mean, there may have been others, but this is the one that's known. Was that the one that Mary Wings put out? Yeah, the, Mary's. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. So here you have people who are, the whole notion of, of queer artists back then, queer comic book artists, was of having an uncensored medium where they're free to just put it all out there. <laughs> and so capturing that, I'm capturing these images, many of which are quite um, in your face, quite explicit. And I never thought it would be a film that would be uh, finding its place in public television. First of all, it's broadcasting, which means it's under the FCC regulations, much like ABC, NBC, CBS, not like Netflix, HBO, Hulu, and the other sh big streamers that are not beholden to FCC rules. But we went knocking on the doors of those commercial streamers, and they multiple times rejected the film. We tried different doors, <laughs> and they just kept rejecting it. After being launched, by the way, at Tribeca, the mm -hmm. film was premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival, which was the premier festival at the time that the film was uh, completed. We were embraced by Tribeca, went on to the next biggie was the Sheffield uh, Doc Festival in England and the American Film Institute Doc Festival in D.C. That was like the Golden Triangle. It's unheard of that we would be uh, included in all three. But the commercial streamers said thumbs down. And uh, Lois Fawson, the executive director of, or I guess her title is executive producer of the Independent Lens series on national public television, approached me. She approached me the first time after Tribeca, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to try for a Netflix, blah, blah, blah. She saw that the film did not get accepted there. She came back. She came back a second time. How about now, Viv? Okay. <laughs> okay, but, you, you know, you understand that if you want to be on national public television, you have to make changes to conform to FCC rules. And I, t I stopped for a moment and I said, I have to check in with the artists. And all five of the artists, one had passed away already, but uh, Howard Cruz, mm -hmm. but his uh, partner, Eddie, I consulted. And they all said, we hate the idea of having to cover up body parts and bleep certain words, 
but for the sake of two to three million viewers and bringing the story to a much bigger audience, we accept the deal. And so began a very arduous process of <laughs> covering. I like to say I created digitized fig leaves <laughs> over the privates. And, right. Um, but it still lends so much character, the way you chose to cover the body parts. <laughs> Well, well, you know, I what I did is I, I they the PBSniks thought that I wouldn't want the distraction, and I want to diminish the distraction of the cover ups as much as possible, and make it as uh, not noticed uh, as much as possible. But I chose the other position. I wanted to be as obvious and bold and blatant as I could make it. And so I did, <laughs> much to their shock. <laughs> but they went along with it, as long as we were conforming with FCC regulations. And by the way, I did argue to, I did push back on some things. And I did try to keep some things overt, uh, some language I tried to keep in place. But the top legal people at National PBS didn't go for it, because we are at a time of very of heightened attack on culture, on the arts. Right. We are at a time of where uh, libraries in schools in North Carolina and Texas are banishing and censoring uh, books right and left. One of the books that's not profiled, but that's included in the film called Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe is yeah. right now today, it is the most banned book in America. I have that book. It's unbelievable. It's an <laughs> amazing it's really... book. I hope that anybody listening to this goes out and buys that book. It's fantastic. Yeah, there's nothing in it that's offensive. It's just about being a non, uh, you know, binary person, and it's heartfelt. And but there's nothing in it that's uh, offensive, uh, except for the fact of a a young person uh, telling it like it is. Well, yeah. What I have to say about that book is that. If you went through puberty and you don't relate to that book, then something's wrong with you. <laughs> That's that is a really great way of capturing the essence of uh, gender queer by Maya yeah. Kobabe. Yeah, I have one other thing. It's not really a question. It's more of just bringing this up to really remark upon it and sort of celebrate it. That Marlon Riggs, your former filmmaking partner, that his tongue's untied is now. What did it get the in the National Film Registry? Which that happened in the last year, didn't it? It just happened last year. And over the years, there were many people who tried uh, at various times to get the uh, tongues untied. Marlon Riggs' landmark work about being a black gay man in America tried to get it into the National Registry of the Copyright Office. What that means is, it, films that are every year, so I think it's some 20 films are selected. And what that means is those films will be forever and ever preserved, mm -hmm. no matter what the formats that happen in the future. Uh, those films that are, that are in the National Registry um, are preserved going forward as part of our uh, national treasure. And they kept rejecting Tongues and Tide. On the, you know, there are various ways of saying no that are polite. I don't know the real way, the real reason. But the overt, the stated reason was that it was created on, in video. And this is the National Film Registry. I knew that at a certain point that was going to have to change because none of my colleagues, you know, is working in 16 millimeter film anymore. Mm -hmm. So I guess the time changed. I was not involved in this particular effort returning uh, to make it happen. But I understand that there was a lot of support for it and I couldn't be happier and prouder of that. And by the way, uh, we did try to bring Tongues Untied back onto National PBS in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, 2019 was the 30th anniversary since um, it had been released. And is that right? 30th or of lost? It was released in 91. I did try, you do the math. <laughs> I did try to uh, bring it back. Actually, I spoke with the folks who had first broadcast the film in, uh, no, it wasn't, yeah, 91. And uh, everything was gung ho to make it happen. But at that time, National PBS found it too controversial to rebroadcast 
and it did not get a repeat performance. Mm. So that was a barometer of how the world has changed um, in the intervening years. Right, right. Well, I am happy that you made this film, and I'm happy at how accessible it is, and I hope as many people as possible see it, and I hope that it's part of a huge body of work that turns that tide again. Thank you very much. I couldn't be more delighted. I'm wondering if you can tell people where they can see the film. Definitely. The film is available on National PBS website. You can go to pbs.org. You'll then click on the Independent Lens series, and No Straight Lines uh, resides there for free to anybody until April 23rd. After April 23rd, then it's behind a paywall, a very small paywall of $6 a month, uh, to be a member of National Public Television. And the money goes to a good cause, and it will be available for three years. For classroom use, that's for private individual use. For those, anybody out there who's teaching or works in a museum or wants to have public exhibition, then I send you over to our distributor at uh, gooddocs.net, G-O-O-D-D-O-C-S dot N-E-T and uh, they'll take care of you. Well, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, Vivian, for <laughs> coming on the show to talk about making this and your process, because I love that. And I'm just so happy for you that you've got this done. I've bumped into you a few times, and it was nearly done, nearly done, nearly done, and it was well worth the wait. Did, did I look kind of pale and skinny from not seeing daylight? <laughs> Well, no, you didn't. You looked fine. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. You're doing really a, such a great uh, service to focus on uh, the process of filmmaking. It's a uh, delight. So thank you so much for what you're doing. At the end of the interview there, Vivian and I were talking about her former filmmaking partner, Marlon Riggs. Marlon Riggs passed away in 1994 due to complications from AIDS. The film we talk about, Tongues Untied, is a documentary film that explores the experience of black gay identity. Tongues Untied is considered a landmark film, and its preservation in the United States National Film Registry is long overdue, but still something to be celebrated. This film first aired on PBS in 1991, and as Vivian mentioned, PBS declined to re-air on the 30th anniversary of its release. They felt that it was too controversial. So, first aired on PBS over 30 years ago, but today it's too controversial. Let that sink in. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. I'm so grateful to Vivian Kleiman for coming on the show to talk about her film, No Straight Lines, The Rise of Queer Comics. You can stream this film on PBS for free until April 23rd, 2023, and then still available for a small fee as a PBS member. We'll put the information in the show notes on how to find this film. Thanks to all of you who are listening. It's always great to hear from you about what resonated with you on the show. Keep in touch on social media or through the show's website, artheelsallwoundspodcast.com. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. This podcast was edited by Eva Christova. As always, this show was recorded using Squadcast FM. Art Heals All Wounds comes to you from Oakland, California, on unceded territory of the Chokeno Ohlone people. 
Hello, I'm Rabia Kuhn, the host of More Than Work podcast. I'm also the marketing manager for an IT development company, a stand-up comedian, a nonprofit volunteer, and sometimes an activist. But enough about me. Let's talk about More Than Work. It's an interview-style show that brings listeners stories of people who have found a way to pursue their passions outside of work or as part of what they do. Having faced burnout a few times myself and realizing my self-worth had become intertwined with my work, I decided to expand what I did outside of my job. I observed the burnout and loss of confidence with my friends and always tried to help. If you are facing or have ever faced the same, or just like hearing other stories, more than work is for you. My chats with guests uncover how they are living lives that allow their self-worth to be more than just their job titles. You can listen and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you get podcasts. It's not a series, so just pick a guest that sounds interesting and enjoy. Again, I'm Rabia. Thanks for giving me the time to tell you about more than work.